So first off, welcome everyone. On behalf of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, the Warren Alpert Medical School, and the School of Public Health of Brown University, I'm pleased to invite you to this webinar titled Live, Experts from Across Brown on COVID-19. So just to begin with some of the rules, we're going to uh, start by introducing our panelists and by uh, inviting each of them to answer some pre-prepared questions that I have for them. Afterwards, we'll be opening it up to all of you in the audience to ask your own questions, uh, and I will direct those to the panelists. Please use the Q&A function uh, for, for this webinar to ask your questions, uh, and then I'll use that to direct the questions to individual panelists. Uh, alternatively, if you'd like to use the Zoom function to raise your hand, uh, then you can do so, and I can call on you to ask your question uh, live. So let me start by introducing myself. My name is Adam Levine, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I'm the director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, whose mission is to promote a just, peaceful, and secure world by furthering a deeper understanding of human rights and humanitarian challenges around the globe and encouraging collaborations between local communities, academics, and practitioners to develop innovative solutions to these challenges. I also serve as the primary investigator for the CDC-funded Global Emergency Response and Recovery Project, which focuses on improving international and local capacity for managing epidemics and pandemics worldwide. My own NIH and foundation-funded research has focused on improving the delivery of emergency care in resource-limited settings during humanitarian emergencies, including epidemics of diseases such as cholera and Ebola in the recent past. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce to you our incredibly talented panelists who will aid us in understanding the current COVID-19 pandemic from a variety of disciplinary perspectives. So first, we have Mark Lurie, who's an infectious disease epidemiologist and an associate professor of epidemiology at Brown University School of Public Health. Over more than two decades, uh, Dr. Lurie's work has focused on the intersection of HIV, TB, and sexually transmitted disease epidemics in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in South Africa, where he's from. Dr. Lurie uh, earned an undergraduate degree in political science and film studies from Boston University and a master's in African history from the University of Florida and a PhD in international health from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. His dissertation addressed the role of labor migration and the spread of HIV in South Africa and migration and health has been a theme of his work since then. He uses primary data collection and mathematical modeling to answer questions about epidemic dynamics and the potential impact of interventions. Next, we have uh, Dr. Wendy Schiller, who's a professor of political science, international public affairs, and chair of the Department of Political Science at Brown University. She did, she did her undergraduate work in political science at the University of Chicago, served on the staffs of Senators Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Governor Mar Mario, Cuomo, uh, Mario Cuomo, and then obtained her PhD from the University of Rochester. After fellowships at the Brookings Institution and Princeton University, she came to Brown University in 1994. She has authored or co-authored numerous books and published articles in the American Journal of Political Science, Legislative Studies Quarterly, Studies in American Political Development, and the Journal of Politics. She regularly provides political commentary for national and local news outlets. Next, Dr. Megan Rainey is an Associate Professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University and director and founder of the Brown Emergency Digital Health Innovation Program. Dr. Rainey's career focus is on developing, testing, and disseminating digital health interventions to prevent violence and mental illness. She is currently principal investigator or co-investigator on nine federally funded grants and has over 100 peer-reviewed publications. She is chief research officer of Affirm Research, the country's leading nonprofit committed to ending the gun violence epidemic through a public health approach. She is also a co-founder of GetUsPPE.org, a startup nonprofit that is matching donations of personal protective equipment to healthcare facilities in need during the current COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, Dr. Judd Brewer is an addiction psychiatrist and neuroscientist. He is Director of Research Innovation at Brown University's Mindfulness Center and Associate Professor of Psychiatry, as well as Behavioral and Social Sciences at Brown Medical School and the School of Public Health. Dr. Brewer has developed clinically proven app-based training to help people with smoking, emotional eating, and anxiety, 
and has studied the underlying brain mechanisms using EEG and fMRI. His work has been featured on 60 Minutes at TED.com and in media outlets across the world. During the current COVID-19 pandemic, he has been putting out daily YouTube videos to help people understand the psychological aspects of this crisis, including everything from problems sleeping to social media and news addiction to panic buying. So thank you all again for joining us and welcome to our August panel. Join me in welcoming them here to you today. So uh, I'll go ahead and start with some questions that I have. And my first question is for uh, Professor Lurie. While there is a tremendous amount that we still don't know about COVID-19, there's actually quite a lot of epidemiological data out there about the virus. What data points are you looking at to make sense of the current state of the epidemic? And can you tell us a little bit about how you think this pandemic is likely to evolve in the coming weeks and months? Thanks, Adam, and thanks for organizing the panel to Watson and Medical School and School of Public Health. Um, I think probably like many people, my day starts um, with the reading of the New York Times and in particular looking at the new data, uh, looking at some of the maps and the other wealth of information that, uh, that they have online. Uh, I usually click over to a couple of the other more academic sites, um, but actually we're getting much of the same data in terms of the number of new cases, the number of deaths that are occurring both in the US and globally. And before sort of responding to some of those numbers, I think it's worth saying that um, we, when we mention numbers, there's a kind of precision, a false precision to numbers. Uh, and it's worth remembering that um, the numbers that we have in terms of the number of cases, uh, the number of deaths are all deeply flawed numbers. Uh, so the number of cases we know is a vast underestimate of the true number of cases. Yesterday in a webinar, our incoming uh, Dean of Public Health um, uh, mentioned that he thought the correct ratio of detected cases to actual cases is about, is about one to 10. So that means we have about 570,000 detected cases in the United States. The real number is probably 10 times that somewhere close to 10 million, sorry, close to 6 million. Um, and, and the reason we don't know uh, all of the cases is that for a variety of reasons, we've had a, a botched rollout of testing. Um, we've limited testing in a major way so that it's not readily available to everybody. And so I bet many people in the audience uh, have friends or family who have suspected or had suspected coronavirus, um, but we're told not to get tested. So if you test a small number of people, you're only gonna get a small number of cases. And sadly, that's where we are today because we, have, because we don't have universal testing. We're uh, really in the dark about the number of new cases that we have. And similarly with deaths, um, we're, uh, each state and sometimes each city has a different protocol for how they report deaths. So some places, uh, deaths that occur amongst people who were never tested for coronavirus, even though they might have died from uh, uh, something related to or directly caused by coronavirus, are often not classified as coronavirus deaths because many places are not doing post-mortem testing. So when we look at the numbers, we have to take them with a grain of salt, uh, knowing that they're deep and inherent flaws in the numbers that we're seeing. Um, having said all of that, there are a few, few numbers that really uh, jump out at me as we try to kind of assess where we are with the epidemic and where we're going. And um, let me share some of those things with you. The first is that um, the beginning of the epidemic, everybody is well aware that um, China was the epicenter of the epidemic. Um, China, over the course of the entire epidemic since the beginning of this year, has had about 85,000 cases. By contrast, in the United States, we've had about 570,000 cases. So we've had nearly six and a half times the number of cases that have occurred in China. And we're getting about 30,000 new cases each day. So that means that just three days in the United States, we're producing roughly the same number of cases that China produced over the entire course of the epidemic. Um, New York is another place that um, many of us are looking to uh, as 
as uh, I think it's fair to say, the current epicenter of the epidemic. And um, uh, with a population of less than 20 million people, New York has about two and a half times the number of cases for the entire country of China, which has a population of 1.4 billion people. So with over 200,000 cases, this is about one third of all the cases in the United States are occurring in New York. And um, one small piece of uh, positive news is that uh, those numbers might be trailing off somewhat, at least in terms of the number of new cases. Um, however, it's important to recognize when we're comparing New York and China, the extent of the differences between those two epidemics. So I gave you some raw numbers, but what's as important as the kind of per capita rates of infection in the, in the two countries. And if you look at the United States, or sorry, if you look at New York, our most impacted place, the rate is about one in 100 or 1%. In China, the rate is a tenth of that or about 0.1%. So massive differences in these uh, epidemics in these two countries. And these are the, the numbers that I look at, in fact, that, that scare me the most, uh, that really show the kind of disparities uh, that um, some other countries have been able to stem their epidemic uh, with a lot of effort, uh, but that we seem in the United States to not yet be on that trajectory. Thank you. Uh, my next question uh, goes for Professor Schiller. So, uh, Professor Schiller, I have to admit that there is a fantasy world in which I sometimes inhabit where the existential threat of a worldwide pandemic forces people to set aside all of their political differences and unite as one human race to defeat this common enemy. Uh, but I think what we've seen is, uh, can be no farther from that. Uh, even our views on the scale of this pandemic and the proper response to it seem to be shaped by our pre-existing political beliefs. How is political polarization affecting the way that Americans are evaluating government response to COVID-19? And are voters using the same criteria to evaluate their governors as the president? So I think you're raising a really important point. Uh, and it's in a trend that's been coming for more than 20 to 25 years, I'd say, you know, conservative estimate, in terms of a consistent effort to undermine the authority of the federal government. It's really been the pitch, uh, mostly the Republican side of things. However, the, you know, uh, extreme left Democrats also have been sort of good getting in on this as well. But essentially, once you opened up news sources, once you see the introduction of cable, and then of course, we exponentially increase that with social media. But there's been a consistent effort to undermine and shrink the federal government starting with Ronald Reagan, but really taking hold under Newt Gingrich and the Republicans in the 90s when they capture control of the Congress. And they're fighting with the Democratic president, but then they get unified Republican government under Bush. So what you see is a consistent undermining, except after 9-11 for national security. But other than that, what the federal government wants you to do is bad. The fight about science, about facts. This has been a generation. It's not just Trump. It's not just social media. It's a generation that undermines the credibility and trust in government. So when government says, or public health officials say, like Mark, like Megan, like Justin, like you, when you say, listen, we have a significant serious problem, this is really dangerous, there's just a wall of resistance to receiving that message from the federal government. I think the, the rainbow, the shiny, whatever light you wanna look for, is that there has been much less resistance to hearing it from governors. And that is across the Republican or Democratic spectrum. Look at Ohio, it's been a pretty reliably red state for a while, probably go red again in 2020, Mike DeWine's a longtime public servant in Ohio, having served in several different roles. He's now governor, and he shut Ohio down early. And Ohioans said, oh, this must be serious. Mike DeWine's telling us it's serious. So there is sort of a breakthrough. There's a way of breaking through the polarized you know, lens that we all carry to this by thinking about the local officials, the people you trust the most, that have to live in the same state you do, under the same conditions you do. Uh, that has seemed to be very effective rather than looking to the president. And this is a particularly polarizing president, and this is a president that is not consistent with facts or what we call truth. Now, there are some things he says that are totally truthful and are factual and get buried um, by the things that he says that aren't. So 
undermining President Bush on the Iraq war and weapons of mass destruction and knowledge about that, undermining Obama about things like Benghazi, for example, undermining Trump about um, everything to do with this particular situation, among other things. All of that leads to where people say, I'm just not accepting what the federal government has to say. And when you need a federal response, as Mark is pointing out, in a lot of these other countries, we don't have the kind of strong federalism we have here. So that's really the key issue. And now the president can't decide whether he wants to blame governors, reward governors, or take it all upon himself. And that is equally confusing to voters. Well, wait, should the government reopen? Does Trump say yes? Does Trump say no? Which is why politically you see governors, both Republican and Democratic governors, uh, really saying, listen, we have to take care of our own. We have to get together regionally. This may not be in the spirit of a national policy, but we're going to take care of our own. And that message seems to have resonated with voters and with citizens and um, people who are, are not necessarily citizens in this country, wearing masks, for example, social distancing, transparency, press conferences. This is good for the democracy. This kind of access, this kind of explaining uh, is good. And it counters some of I think the damage that polarization does to um, public health messaging, which is really the, the, the takeaway, of course, is we cannot be safe in a public health manner if we don't have trust in our government. And this has been come home to roost in a really tragic way, I think, right now. Thank you for those comments and for disabusing me of my fantasies. Um, <laughs> but give me hope, on. a little bit of hope. Me a little bit of hope, yes, definitely. <laughs> Um, so next to uh, Dr. Megan Rainey. So if the coronavirus were a comic book villain, then health workers of all stripes would be the heroes of the story. Yet paradoxically, they are also the most vulnerable to infection due to their close contact with the virus on a daily basis. As a frontline health worker yourself, how does it feel to be so powerful and vulnerable at the same time? And please also tell us more about the work you've been doing to protect your colleagues across the country during this pandemic. Thank you, Adam. As one of my own colleagues, I know that you're experiencing this uh, in the emergency department as well. Um, and maybe at the end, we can share some of those comic book images of coronavirus kind of coming down and healthcare workers uh, standing in, in uh, pursuit and trying to defeat it. Um, I think that one of the really tough things about this pandemic is that we as healthcare workers um, whether it's doctors, nurses, psychologists, um, respiratory therapists, signed up uh, for this profession uh, because we're committed to healing um, and to taking care of patients at moments of need. Most of us did not sign up to be heroes, right? And I know there's a lot of war metaphors going around right now around this pandemic. And it's honestly sitting poorly with a lot of healthcare professionals who say, we are not warriors, we are not frontline troops, we are not here to run into burning buildings. Um, we're here to provide scientifically valid, empathetic, humanistic care to our patient populations. And the part of this pandemic that has been so um, morally and ethically challenging for many of our colleagues, both locally and across the country, is two things. The first is that the science is simply not there right? We are acting in a void of knowledge. Uh, this is a brand new virus that was never seen until about four months ago. We are creating scientific knowledge about best possible treatments as quickly as we possible, possibly can, but we still don't really know if this virus is passed through droplets and contact or if it's passed through uh, aerosol spread. I mean, there's these really simple things that, that there's still a lot of debate about, much less um, as Wendy has mentioned, some of the um, false facts that have been spread about potential treatments um, and about uh, ways for uh, the community to protect themselves. So it puts healthcare workers in this very uncomfortable position, right, where we're trying to take care of people but really don't know how to care for them best. Um, there's been some wonderful rapid experimentation going on both locally and nationally, which is hopefully leading to improved outcomes, but we're really not going to know for a little bit. The other part, of course, um, that's, that's very difficult um, are these ethical debates about um, our health versus our patient's health. Um, as has been amply covered by the news, there is a dramatic shortage um, in equipment of all kinds uh, within the healthcare space right now. 
Um, what has been covered most are the shortages in what is called personal protective equipment. Um, things like masks, gowns, gloves, hand sanitizer, the stuff that we use as healthcare providers to keep ourselves safe. And that I know that you used you know, during the Ebola epidemic so successfully to help keep almost all healthcare workers who went in in relief efforts safe and that you successfully trained local folks um, in using as well. You know, we're being told in healthcare right now to reuse things that are normally disposable, to change our protocols based on supply, not based on science. And that puts us potentially at risk. And we know that across the world, healthcare workers have been um, some of the most likely to not just be infected, but also to die. And so there's this question of, you know, do I put myself at risk? What does that mean to be in this, you know, burning building when I'm not supposed to be a frontline warrior? There's also the ethical debate, which is uncomfortable, about what do we do, again, not just because we don't have science, but also because we don't have equipment, about these very, very ill patients. What happens if and when we run out of ventilators? What about the fact that we're running out of um, uh, multi-dose inhalers, the albuterol inhalers that we use for wheezing, are, are simply uh, on short supply. So are many of these sedative medications that we use when we intubate people and put them into medical comas. And that puts us in these very uncomfortable situations that many of us talked about in medical school or nursing school or um, our PhD programs about these bioethical decisions, but in a very real in your face way that's um, challenging for a lot of frontline healthcare workers. Um, in response to these challenges, uh, going off of Professor Schiller's excellent comments about creating hope, um, I, I've been absolutely blown away by the grassroots efforts within the medical community to both enhance and share science organically, whether it's within WhatsApp groups or Facebook, but also to protect our own. And in a um, just the most unselfish and community building way. Um, GetUsPPE.org, which I helped co-found along with a group of other emergency physicians and software developers and nurses and makers from across the country is one example of that, but there are others too, where we found this volunteer community that's come together and has said, well, we can feel angry and despondent and defeated um, by the lack of federal response and by the lack of supplies and by the, you know, absolutely frozen um, data on, on a national level, or we can create innovative um, solutions. Uh, one colleague of mine in New York has, who works in the digital health space has labeled this the health doers. Um, folks that say, well, there's a problem here, I am going to go fix it. And within Get Us PPE, what we've done is created this website that um, takes in uh, folks that have uh, donations, whether it's, you know, you have some N95 masks sitting in your back basement from a construction project, or whether you're a nail salon that has a huge supply of procedural masks sitting around, um, or whether you're a maker who's creating gowns and 3D printed face shields. And then also takes in uh, needs from healthcare centers across the country. Um, we have more than 7,000 facilities that have put in their needs for various types of um, protective equipment. And then we match it. And we have actually a bunch of Brown uh, med students who are working closely with us, including Charlotte Lee and Benjamin Pallant, who are helping to lead this program um, to make sure that our matches are done equitably. So with an eye, not just to political expediency and who gets PPE supplies, but also making sure that those donated supplies go where they're most needed um, with an eye towards safety net hospitals, um, uh, clinics that serve vulnerable and underserved populations in the places that really don't have the financial reserves to purchase. Um, and it's just been a, a beautiful example of how we can create hope and you know, that optimistic alternative scenario for what the healthcare system will look like in the future. Um, and hopefully provides a little bit of sustenance to those frontline healthcare workers who, you know, again, Adam, as, as you know well, working in the emergency department, um, our colleagues across the country feel abandoned um, by the larger system. And so trying to make them remind them that they are not just, you know, heroes in name, but that they do have a support system underneath them to help them stay healthy so that they can keep taking care of their patients. Thank you, Megan. That's very grounding for all of us, I think. Um, finally, I'll turn to uh, Dr. Brewer. So as Dr. Rainey alluded, we are seeing an incredible amount of generosity and ingenuity during this pandemic, not only from health workers, but from many others around the country. But we are also seeing record levels of fear and anxiety. 
both as individuals and as a society, how do we prevent that fear and anxiety from turning to panic or something even worse? And what role does the media have to play in peaking or flattening our collective anxiety curve, to use a public health metaphor? Great, great question. So I think it's helpful to start by just understanding how our minds work. If our minds are a black box, you know, how can we possibly work with them? We'll, you know, push this button here and not know that it does anything or not. So very basic level, you know, fear is actually a survival mechanism. It helps us learn. So for example, if we step out into the street and we almost get hit by a car, we actually learn, hey, not such a great idea. Look both ways before crossing the street. And for anybody to, um, we can actually, anybody can understand this. It actually only has three elements for, for these types of reinforcement learning processes. You need a, a trigger, a behavior, and a result or a reward from a brain standpoint. So the trigger would be walking up to the street. The behavior would be lo looking both ways. And then the reward is, is surviving, right? And so from a basic learning standpoint, this is evolutionarily conserved all the way back to sea slugs. They learn the same way that humans do in terms of both positive and negative reinforcement. So here, I think it's helpful to just know, oh, this is a basic learning mechanism that helps us survive. Fear is not necessarily a bad thing. But if you think of the um, survival brain, right, that's where these fear and, and reinforcement learning mechanisms come in. On top of this, we've layered uh, neocortex, which literally means new brain, which is also involved in survival, but in a different way, more in terms of thinking and planning. And what our neocortex and say the prefrontal cortex in particular needs is information. And as folks have already been mentioning, you know, Mark mentioned this as well. We don't have a lot of information. You know, Megan was talking about this as well. We don't have a lot of information about, um, about what's going on and you know, everything from, you know, what, how this virus is actually transmitted to how long we're going to need to be locked down, all these things. So that doesn't stop our planning and thinking brain from acting. <laughs> and we can think of this in terms of, of uncertainty. So when there's uncertainty, um, our brain, you know, we actually get itchy and restless and our brain says, hey, I need information, go get me information. And it urges us into action. So we go and look around. And so we go on social media, we listen to the news, we do whatever to try to get accurate information. But when that information isn't there, our brain says, well, I'm still going to do something. And so we actually start to spiral out into anxiety and worry. So we can think of it this way, fear, helpful survival, fear plus uncertainty can actually lead to anxiety. Okay. And so anxiety or worry uh, can actually get reinforced in the same way that these fear survival loops do. So fear could be the trigger. Worry can be the mental behavior. And then the result of feeling like we're doing something feels better than not doing something, at least to our untrained brains. So we can actually start to spiral into worry and anxiety habit loops. The problem is that that makes our prefrontal cortex go offline. It's harder to think and plan. If you add to this the element of social contagion, which is just the spread of uh, affect or emotion from one person to another, that actually can, can lead to panic. So if you think about, you know, if you get on the phone with somebody and they're anxious, then we're more likely to get anxious. If we go on social media and there are a bunch of people freaking out, we're more likely to catch that social contagion. So while you can use PPE and other ways to protect yourself from a physical, physically acquiring a virus, somebody can seize on your brain from anywhere in the world, you know, for social contagion. So much more contagious in that respect. It doesn't have a physical distance uh, barrier. So here, you know, if we go on social media, we see people panicking, we're more likely to panic. If we go in the grocery store and we see somebody, you know, hoarding a bunch of food, or I don't know why toilet paper became the meme, but there it is, you know, get, buying all the toilet paper, even though we didn't need toilet paper, our scarcity mode kicks in. And then we move into what panic literally is defined as wildly unthinking behavior. <laughs> we go and buy the toilet paper, somebody else sees us buying, buying toilet paper, and then suddenly there's a run on toilet paper, the grocery store, even though that's, that's absolutely not what our planning and thinking brains would do, okay? So fear plus uncertainty leads to anxiety, anxiety plus social contagion, that sneeze on the brain leads to panic. And with panic, our prefrontal cortex is completely offline. That's where this wildly unthinking behavior comes in. So I think those pieces are important to keep in mind 
Uh, the last thing I'll mention is, as, as Megan and, and Wendy and others were saying, there is hope. If we can do simple mindfulness practices or, you know, I, and I just study that there are other ways to ground ourselves, prayer, yoga, you know, things like that. We can use these as ways to just simply help our, our thinking, you know, ground ourselves in our present moment experience. And that helps our thinking brain come back online so it can actually plan and think so that it can help us move forward without panicking. And that's why I've been putting out these, these videos on YouTube if folks are interested in learning some of these specific practices, I put something in with each, each day's video. So I'll, I'll just put it there. I think there is hope there. And I, actually I'll just end, I think Megan said this beautifully, you know, we can also tap into our brain's natural reward system because the brain is always looking for what I think of as a BBO, a bigger, better offer. And so if we see that kindness and connection feel better than divisiveness and selfishness, our brains will naturally, we will all move toward, hey, wait a minute, let's come out on the other end of this together because it just feels better. And so we can actually follow our brains if we simply just pay attention to what it feels like when we're supporting each other, when we're going, you know, when we're doing all these things that help each other just feel so much better than being selfish or divisive or, or whatever. So here I would urge everyone simply to pay attention what it feels like when somebody's being kind to you, when you're practicing acts of kindness, when you're getting out there, you know, building an organization like Get, Get Us PPE, like just to hear about that inspires me to, to do that. And let, you know, let's let, let that connection be the new infection, so to speak. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So I guess there is hope for my fantasy world after all. All right, uh, we're gonna open it up now to questions from the audience uh, for the remaining 50 minutes or so that we have here. And so um, please enter your questions into the Q&A box, uh, or if you'd like to raise your hand, we can try and do it that way as well. Um, I will try to get to your questions and I will also reserve the right to throw in additional questions of my own to the panelists as well. Um, so let's start here with a uh, not at all controversial question. This is for uh, Dr. Schiller. So you have predicted that a crisis favors the incumbent. Is this possibly true even in the case of this president who has dangerously mishandled this crisis through his denial, lies, and lack of leadership? Well, I can't comment on the second clause of that question, but I can certainly uh, go to the first. And uh, two things to watch uh, really quickly are, you know, I, and I'm going to leave also to to, um, to Judson to comment on this as well. Is that when you're searching for hope, as as the you know we're all on this panel searching for hope, you want to subconsciously believe in the president right now if you're in the United States because you've typically looked to the president or culturally we look to the president to solve problems or protect us in a time of scariness. Let's just put it that way. So even if you don't like President Trump, even if you don't want to see him reelected. You know, a vast majority of the country will want to believe that he is right when he says, oh, we can open up in a couple of weeks. And I think it's pretty obvious from a lot of the evidence that you've already been talking about and the things that we don't know, it's probably not going to happen in a couple of weeks, but giving people some end date to what is an unprecedented experience for them psychologically is something we look to the president to do. So it helps the president when in fact he tries to give people some hope and some and calm them down and say we'll get out of things you know that people don't trust what trump says on one side of the coin but trust him on the other is what makes it precarious because if he does convey um, bad information quote unquote bad information for public health safety then you worry that he will make things worse but the second thing that i recall from 2016 that i just thought of actually yesterday after watching a fairly remarkable press performance by the president was that in 2016, Trump got a ton of press the whole spring. People didn't even think he would get the nomination. And Hillary Clinton didn't, but the press covered Trump rallies and whatever he said. And he said outrageous things. And they just gave him a ton of coverage. This time, they're doing the same thing as president. They're giving him an hour, two hours for these press briefings, which is a massive amount of free press. And that, it reinforces his base and reinforces his position as president of the United States. So as we come out of this, and we hope we do, don't be surprised uh, if his approval ratings don't sink. Uh, they did go down as deaths went up, they went down, but that as it creeps up again, if the economy improves, because people wanna believe that if he does well, the country will do well. And so that's, that's, Larry, that, that's where the advantage lies 
for an incumbent in this very difficult time. Okay. So um, we have a question for Dr. Lurie. So you spoke about the comparisons to the Chinese infection numbers, uh, but do you believe that these numbers from China are accurate? And then more generally, is it really possible to compare data across countries when there's such varying scales of testing and transparency? Thanks, I think that's a great question and it sort of answers itself. Um, I think I try to make the point that we should be deeply skeptical about the numbers that we're seeing for a variety of reasons. Um, and that cross-national comparisons are even more difficult because different countries may have different incentives uh, in terms of uh, how they explain the epidemic to the public and how open they are and truthful about the true number of cases that they have. Um, on the other hand, the numbers are all that we have, right? Um, uh, they may be flawed, uh, they may be deeply problematic, um, but they're the best count that we have of what's actually going on. So with the grain of salt, I do take them uh, uh, somewhat seriously, but I agree with the questioner that it's problematic to compare different countries um, just because of the, the way that different places conduct their counts and the kind of hidden incentives that some places may have to hide the true number of cases that exist. Okay. Um, we have a, another question for uh, Professor Schiller, um, and potentially we can open this up to others as well if they have thoughts. Um, so we have seen a wide variety of ways that different governments around the planet are responding to this pandemic. Um, can you mention some of the factors that help us understand uh, some of the variations in the responses of different governments? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm going to leave the, uh, the medical responses to Dr. Rainey and, and, and Professor Brewer and Murray, just they can cover that because I think they're much more familiar with it. But in terms of just the structure of um, everything from sort of uh, public health regulation on regulating hospitals, on certifying who can do what, on, you know, regulations concerning testing, whether you have a centralized command, whether you have, in fact, private companies doing it at state level or state departments of health doing it. There's all these ways in which federalism, which is enshrined in our constitution, really creates a far different environment to confront a public health crisis than any of the other countries we're really talking about, Italy or China. Even Germany has federalism, but it's really federalism light, not really the entrenched bureaucratic federalism that we have here. So that's my short answer. I think I'll, I'll leave it to Dr. Rainey maybe to pick it up and talk about the healthcare differences. Yeah, so um, differences in the way that the healthcare systems are organized. Um, you know, we look at uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Israel, where they've developed um, wonderful both epidemiologic tracking mechanisms. They've rolled out testing. Um, they're doing excellent contact tracing. They are um, uh, creating kind of nationalized systems of distribution of protective equipment and other medical supplies, um, and then compare it to what we're doing here in the United States. Now, some of the issues with how we have responded are due to the way that our healthcare system is structured, right? Um, as Professor Schiller mentioned, um, there are very different mechanisms of financing here compared to say the NHS um, or other nationalized healthcare systems. Um, but it's more than that. Um, it's also about that way that our public health system is organized and funded. And I, again, really also about that kind of, as Professor Schiller mentioned, about that systemic defunding um, of a federal response. When you compare the way that we are reacting and planning, both planning for and reacting to this pandemic compared to how we've handled other pandemics in the past, the uh, missteps are not inherent to our healthcare system or inherent to our political system. You can look at other countries like say New Zealand um, or Switzerland, which certainly has its issues, um, but is, is, is in a better spot. Um, you can also look at countries like Britain, which do have um, the NHS and yet are in a very similar position in terms of both lack of PPE and high infection rates compared to us. Um, and it's because of the way that the kind of political leadership has handled it. Um, what could have been done differently? Well, we know um, that under uh, the Obama administration that there was a strong pandemic planning task force, right? We know that um, at the time of transition from one administration to another that 
um, they, we, tr you know, try to pass on that, that planning knowledge. Um, we know that we have been through planning for Ebola, SARS, H1N1, et cetera, before. Um, we know that there is a need for national level testing and coordination of data and for national level public health messaging. Um, Second, we may have a... What, sorry? No, it's okay. Go on, please. Oh, okay. Sorry. He was commenting um, that there wasn't really a coordinated national messaging right now. No, no, that we know that there should be, but there isn't. Right. Yes. There isn't. Yeah. No, there Sorry, there, you, what I'm saying, what could, what could happen? So what could we imagine would happen in the United States? It would be that the federal government would say, listen, this is an emergency situation. We need national level data. And Dr. Ja, who Professor Lurie mentioned, who's the incoming dean, he and I wrote a piece together for the New England Journal a couple of weeks ago, right? Talking about what could be done, which is that you roll out national level testing. You take all that testing back up to the national level. Um, you do a national survey of needs for PPE and for other medical supplies, and you use that to equitably distribute to direct production um, and to, to direct donations across the country. You do um, high level public health messaging, create a playbook that's passed out to state level um, departments of health and county level departments of health so that each municipality and each state doesn't have to create its own. There's a lot of stuff that can be done even in our federalized system uh, much more effectively. I'll stop. <laughs> I'm wondering, Adam, if you could comment on how you and how Watson Institute are approaching this. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you've got a lot to say here as well. <laughs> Thanks so much um, for putting me in the hot seat. I enjoy putting others uh, in that seat. Um, so I think that, um, you know, it certainly is true. You know, one thing that has really blown me away about COVID-19 is how different this pandemic is in so many ways from all of the past ones that we've seen. So I was there in Liberia and Sierra Leone during the uh, uh, 2014 to 2015 Ebola epidemic. Uh, I worked a lot actually in the last year on the most recent Ebola epidemic in Eastern Congo. I've responded to cholera uh, epidemics all over the world from the Caribbean to South Asia. Um, and we also saw the way that the world responded and the way that individual countries responded during more recent respiratory uh, epidemics, such as uh, SARS and H1N1. And this has been, you know, really quite dramatic in terms of how it's impacted literally every country on earth. Now more than 180 countries have widespread community transmission. Um, and, you know, I think that there are, you know, individual viral factors. Uh, there is a lot of bad luck. There are some missteps, both in China and the United States and Europe and other places, there's lots of blame that can go around that led to the pandemic growing so large. But I, I think at some point we also have to recognize that this might be our future, uh, that the reality of our interconnected global world is that when these zoonotic illnesses jump from animals to humans, we are going to see them explode across the world stage. And that leaves us with sort of a really profound thing to think about as we move out of this pandemic, however we move out of it. And there's some questions getting to that that I'll be delivering to you guys soon. But however we get out of this particular pandemic, uh, how are we gonna prepare for the next one? And how are we gonna be better prepared the next time around? And that's gonna require actions all the way down from the very local level. It's gonna require actions to ensure that uh, the nurse working in the most rural clinic in the most rural part of Asia or Latin America or Africa or anywhere in the world is trained to recognize a new or novel infectious disease and report it immediately, all the way up to uh, the way our national governments are set up to produce protective equipment, to produce laboratory testing, to uh, organize contact tracing, uh, and all the way up to the international level in how WHO works, uh, potentially even a rewriting of the international health regulations that will need to happen. So. I think it is kind of uh, important to keep in context that this is really unprecedented in the way uh, we think about even sort of massive pandemic responses in general. Um, we do have a ton of questions that have come in just now. Uh, and so I wanna make sure to try and direct as many of them as I can. Uh, we do have a, a couple of questions here for uh, Dr. Brewer. Um, so they are not totally related, but I'll throw them both out to you and you can choose how you answer them. So one is asking about uh, handling addiction during a time like this with increasing anxiety and little modes of distraction. And I'll add uh, perhaps reduced access to people's healthcare providers uh, during the pandemic. And the second is how you think that the 
level of anxiety and the issues that we're facing now compared to 9-11 um, and uh, the anxiety that we saw in the aftermath of that event. Both great questions. Let's start with the first one. You know, I have a buprenorphine clinic and it's uh, gone telemedicine slash virtual. And that was actually a relatively smooth transition toward that. So uh, hopefully other clinics are able to do that as well. So people can see their, um, their healthcare providers, uh, even if it's in a way that's uh, physically safe. Uh, I know that the health insurance companies are working hard to uh, reduce any barriers to entry there and, and barriers to getting prescriptions and things like that. So that's, that's good news. I've also seen from the uh, recovery community that people have taken 12-step uh, and other types of support groups online. Uh, and that actually makes it accessible to anybody with internet um, an internet connection. So uh, I think there's been a really nice grassroots movement there for people, you know, necessity being the mother of invention. Uh, and there are some technology platforms that make that very uh, straightforward for people to do. Some of my patients have talked about how they're still meeting in person because there's a um, there's something about you know just being kind of in person, but they're keeping their groups um, small, you know, four or five people, trying to really uh, keep in mind these um, these protective measures to uh, reduce the transmission. So those are those are all good things. I think one thing for people to keep in mind there's this uh, acronym that uh, that I learned. I mean, maybe in medical school or residency, which is HALT, uh, when people are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, uh, they're more vulnerable to relapse. Basically, you can think of this as anything that makes our prefrontal cortex, cortex go offline. So stress, anxiety are big predictors of relapse, um, big causes for people to, um, to fall into use. And so just knowing those, um, knowing those vulnerabilities and keeping an eye on those is helpful. And also finding simple practices that people can do to keep their anxiety levels at a baseline lower. So, cause we're all going to get bumped a little bit. Um, but the lower we can keep our baseline, the less likely we are to get bumped over the edge. And so here, you know, I think of, you know, mindfulness, uh, one of the things, one of the many things we can do, uh, making sure that we eat healthy food, uh, get some exercise, uh, sleep enough at night, really making sure that we all take care of ourselves is going to be a really important way uh, to reduce the likelihood that that um, any you know addiction is going to get worse or um, or kind of come come to four where it's been dormant. Uh, can you remind me what the second question was? It was a comparison of the current event to 9/11, and you know how you see differences in the way people are reacting or similarities. Yeah, well, I, one of the biggest difference that I, differences that I there are two big differences that I see just uh, off the top of my head. One is we didn't have social media in the same way that we have it now. Um, you know, the, these weapons of mass distraction, you know, our, our cell phones um, didn't, didn't get invented, so to speak. Um, the smartphones weren't rolled out, starting to get rolled out until 2007. And then at a mass scale later, um, you know, things like Facebook weren't, weren't really around. So the ability to spread uh, fear and panic through social contagion really wasn't as um, available back in 2001. Uh, and, and so I remember just, you know, watching the news um, and, you know, that's, that's how I kind of got my information very different now. Uh, the other thing is that the, you know, that was a, a relatively singular event. Um, and then there were, there was all this stuff, how are we going to prevent it from happening again? This is an ongoing level of uncertainty. You know, we don't know, like I won't reiterate all the things that we don't know, but there are many things that are still uncertain and our brains really don't like uncertainty. And so I think that uncertainty is really keeping, is kind of festering that anxiety uh, as well in a way that, that we didn't see, or certainly I didn't see personally um, back in 2001. So on that topic, oh, and Megan, actually, did you want to, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to add one other thing about 9-11, which is at, during 9-11, I mean, I was uh, in New York at the time and it was unbelievably traumatic, but we were able to get together as a community, mm. right? We responded to it by joining together, mm. going um, 
to each other's houses. Like there, there was a community outpouring and a sense of community spirit there that I think is really missing right now mm -hmm. uh, because we're all isolated, right? We're all physically distanced. We're mm -hmm. all on Zoom. We're not able to create those community sacred spaces, um, the, the posters, the, the things that sustained us during 9-11. Yeah, a really important point. Actually, I was going to uh, direct a question to you next, uh, Dr. Rainey. Um, in response to some of what uh, Dr. Brewer is saying, so you have uh, prior experience using digital technology for health communication. How do you think it could help us improve messaging during the current pandemic? Oh, this is um, so much of what I spend my life on during normal time is how do we use digital technology to improve health and, and health messaging? Um, I think there are a lot of ways that we can do it. So uh, first is the grassroots or organic. It's things like our hashtag get me PPE, um, which you can't control, you can't plan it. It's really um, comes from the bottom and, and rises up. So that's um, the first thing. Um, the second thing is like Dr. Brewer already mentioned, um, the use of digital technology to purposefully support um, our most at risk and vulnerable populations. Um, whether it's through things like um, disseminating the YouTube videos that um, Judd has created around mindfulness, whether it's through programs like um, an STTR that um, I'm working on, uh, we're finishing our phase one, which is a mobile peer support program for patients um, in recovery from opioid use disorder, right? A way for people to, to virtually support each other, um, uh, which can be huge. Um, whether, so, so that's kind of another option is having these targeted interventions for specific vulnerable populations. Um, the third thing is through, um, again, great public health messaging, um, whether it's from departments of health, whether it's from universities like Brown. Um, there was some nice research that's come out of England looking at the efficacy of different forms of communication and improving hand washing practices and um, adherence to social distancing guidelines. Uh, and, and that's largely a digital intervention. And I think that we can use um, technology in that way as well. Finally, of course, is telehealth. Um, as has already been mentioned, we are seeing this dramatic rise in the use of telehealth. I think um, we're gonna look back 10 years from now or even five years from now and say this pandemic was the turning point for um, regular Americans acceptance and for many physicians comfort with um, evaluating, diagnosing and treating a patient through interviews like this. Uh, and I think that thinking through ways to take telehealth and to match it with longitudinal care um, delivered digitally. Um, there are certainly a number of commercial products. There are also a lot of great things that are being investigated within the med school and the School of Public Health right now, um, I think can, can provide a, a large source of comfort and sustained care um, around wellness and chronic diseases. Uh, as well as around kind of mental illness and behavioral risk factors um, for our at-risk populations. Thank you. Um, so uh, there are several questions uh, for you, Dr. Lurie. I'll just uh, direct you one quick one and then one maybe longer one. So the quick one asks, you had mentioned about the unreliability of some of the statistics around cases and deaths, uh, but what about hospitalizations? Do you see that as a more reliable statistic that we can use to get a picture, a better picture of the pandemic. And then a little bit of a more difficult one, I think, is given your background in infectious disease research, how long do you think it will take to develop a vaccine and how rapidly would a vaccine be able to be distributed to people in the United States once it's developed? Sure, let's start with the second one because I think that's an easier question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, depends how optimistic you are. Um, if you're the president, you think that a vaccine is just around the corner. Uh, most of us who have worked in this field know that it takes quite a long time for a vaccine to be developed and indeed for a vaccine to be distributed. Um, I think optimistically, uh, if things go well scientifically, we may be uh, somewhere around a year away from having a vaccine. And, and that would be kind of, that would be considered a remarkably quick development of a vaccine for a brand new disease who, which had never been seen before uh, up until a couple of months ago. Um, but I think it's quite a long way off. There are obviously a number of really important steps that have to be taken before a vaccine can be uh, judged to be safe. And then furthermore, before it can be judged to be effective. Um, those are gonna take 
require human trials and human trials take time and they're going to require considerable numbers uh, sample size of uh, people in order to test the efficacy of those uh, vaccines. Um, the vaccine, I think, is a bright light at the end of the tunnel, um, but I don't think we see that light yet. It has the potential to really alter the scale of the epidemic, our response to the epidemic, and the possibility of kind of further epidemics as we start to ease restrictions. Um, but sadly, that's not here with us yet, and it's going to be quite a while, realistically, until any of us uh, are going to be administered a safe and effective vaccine for COVID-19. Um, the other question was about uh, the numbers and specifically whether um, hospitalization rates can be used to get a better sense of the epidemic. Um, my answer to that is that it's complicated because we know that a lot of infections are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And of course, those people are never going to come to the hospital and never get counted. And we don't really know what proportion of people fall into that category. So hospitalization rates tell us something, but different people are going to get hospitalized under different conditions. And for me, and if I'm in a state with, uh, that hasn't really had a large epidemic yet, uh, I might get hospitalized Whereas if I'm in a state like New York, which is overrun, uh, my symptoms might be deemed uh, not sufficient for hospitalization. So it's going to produce uh, an uneven look at, uh, at where the epidemic stands. What I recommend, though, is not so much using any specific data point, um, but really um, trying to get a better sense of what the trends are. Um, one data point doesn't tell us much, and we know that uh, each data point itself is flawed for the reasons that we've talked about before. But I think if we uh, take that into account, but then look at trends over time, uh, that's what's really going to tell us uh, where we are with the epidemic. So I'm always interested in looking at the classic epidemic curve, which shows us the number of new cases over time. And that's where I'm really looking to see whether the epidemic has peaked or is going to peak soon. Um, hospitalization and death, those are things that happen later on and we would expect and in fact do see a, a lag time between uh, hospitalization, uh, so between infection rates and either hospitalization or death rates. There's gonna be several weeks before uh, those things kind of catch up to each other. So the infection rates are the things that I'm going to be looking at, not so much the, uh, the, the actual number of new infections, but more how does that compare to yesterday and the day before and the week before that. Right. Okay, so for this next question, um, I'll actually take the first shot at answering it and then open it up uh, to any other panelists. Um, so can any of the panelists talk about how this is affecting refugee communities, both in terms of how countries are changing their policies about refugee acceptance and how refugee camps are dealing with this? So, you know, what I can tell you that uh, isn't being reported as much as it should is how many countries around the world are now flagrantly in violation of the 1951 Refugee Convention. And it's incredible how this spans countries of all different sorts uh, from the United States, which is rapidly deporting refugees across its southern border into Mexico, to countries in Europe like Greece and Italy, which are turning back uh, refugees without processing them as they're required to under the convention that they've signed. Uh, but then all across Africa and across uh, other parts of South Asia, we're seeing uh, countries closing their borders to everybody, including refugees um, who uh, are fleeing political persecution and therefore are different and have different legal status than other types of uh, migrants or individuals wanting to come into a country. So this is hugely problematic um, for refugees who are fleeing violence and uh, political persecution in their countries, but even more problematic is the situation for refugees who are currently living in camps in various countries, especially those that are now starting to see upticks in the number of cases of COVID-19. Uh, the whole concept of social distancing is a joke in a refugee camp where you have an entire household living in a single small tent uh, where you barely have adequate water uh, for drinking uh, and basic sanitation, let alone the hand washing every 10 minutes that all of us are doing here in the United States and in Europe. Um, and you know, even more so, you just have people packed really close together 
without adequate health services and without any possibility for being able to diagnose a specific uh, cough as COVID-19 versus anything else. So you really are set up for rapid spread through these communities uh, on a level that's orders of magnitude greater than what we saw in nursing homes here in the United States. Um, so I think that that, as we get the pandemic under control in the US, in Europe, we're going to be seeing flare-ups of it in low-income and middle-income countries, and a lot of that will probably be centered in refugee camps. And honestly, I have not seen countries doing a lot to actually deal with that at this point. I know, yeah, Marker. I'll, yeah, I'll just take a politics Wendy, of that. Go. I mean, I think the politics of that is so, you know, in this administration in particular, uh, which has been um, not welcoming, frankly, to refugees, at least refugees from predominantly Muslim countries, uh, not just the travel ban, but also just refugee status. And there's like two kinds of refugees, refugees here who apply, who are kind of in the United States in residence, um, and then those that come from abroad and what the Trump numbers look like are not that different from Obama numbers, but the vast majority of people getting uh, uh, refugee status are already here. So what's dropped dramatically is the number of people being let in from anywhere else. And that rhetoric won't change with this administration. If Trump is reelected for the next four years, it will get no better, it will get worse. Uh, because there's just ideologically poor belief about this. And that is, the, I think, the great difficulty. But it's also a difficulty because so many people here are in low-income communities. I mean, you look at New Orleans and you can go to Dr. Lurie about epidemiologically how that has become such a disaster zone. And the people who are being, you know, are dying are low-income, of color, who, have, who may or may not have underlying health conditions, but those are socioeconomic as well. So there's a mentality in America, and I, I don't know where, around the whole world, but there's a mentality in America when things are tough and, and people here are really suffering, not in the exact same way refugee camps, but certainly close to it in areas of very low income. The idea is, well, why are we helping them when we should be helping us? And the point you're making, I think is so, so right, is that we're global, we're global now, so that if we don't help them, we don't help us. This just comes back to us later. So I think that's the real political challenge. It's a very big challenge. I don't, you know, I don't know if Dr. Lurie wants to add to the, the sort of, you know, how we can un unpack who's dying from COVID-19. Because lately, at least in the last week, the messaging has really been that particular populations are dying at just much, much greater numbers than anybody else. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, and there are questions about this already, um, seeing stark racial disparities that exist across uh, societies, uh, and the epidemic is, is really just exacerbating those. Um, but I wanted to come back also to something that Adam said in describing the conditions of refugee camps as places that are ripe for the spread of coronavirus. Uh, obviously, he did so correctly. But it's also worth turning out that, uh, worth, worth pointing out that um, non refugee camps, uh, uh, large cities, uh, urban slums, uh, these are places that face very similar kinds of conditions that are also going to be. Uh, hotspots for transmission. I think of Mumbai, I think of Lagos, I think of, you know, Soweto. Uh, these are places where social distancing is um, really not an option for the majority of people living there and compounded by uh, poor healthcare systems that are already overwhelmed uh, and that lack anything even close to the amounts of medical equipment that we have in the U.S. and we've seen how uh, shortages uh, play out even in our country. So I think uh, refugees are critically important, but it's also worth remembering that uh, many other people around the world are living in similar conditions that are going to be highly conducive to the spread of coronavirus. That's an excellent point. Um, you know, someone had asked a question that kind of pairs with this a little bit, and you had mentioned it a little bit, but I'll just also throw it out to see if there are other thoughts people have. And this related to really the racial and social inequities in the United States, the pre-existing racial and social inequities in the United States, and how those are now resulting in higher rates of mortality in uh, certain communities. Uh, do you think that this is going to uh, actually catalyze any work to uh, solve that problem in the future? Or is this just going to heighten uh, those inequities as we move out of the pandemic? Uh Megan, you want to take this first, or you want? To, I can go first just for a minute and and and, and open up to everybody else. Sure. Um, just really quickly, there are two. There's there's the hope side, and then there's the fear side. The hope side I have 
is that this really shines the light on things like obesity and on what you eat and food sources in low income communities themselves. What do we have in those bodegas? What do we have in those supermarkets? You know, what, what is food stamps encouraged buying or not encouraged? You know, all the kinds of things we think about that create health inequities between people with money and people without money. And I, and I hope that we think much more about that in a public health kind of way. My fear is that this becomes racially stereotyped the way many other things are racially stereotyped in society and that uh, you know, white middle income, upper income people who haven't lost anybody or haven't experienced this just decide it's somebody else's disease and somebody else's problem and the, we go in the opposite direction. And I, I genuinely don't know which direction. We have the capacity to go in either direction. I don't know which way we'll go. Yeah, I, I want to echo what Wendy just said. I think that we can create this utopian scenario and also a very dystopian scenario. I can say from my work on other issues that are inherently tied up with um, socioeconomic and racial structural inequality. As many of you know, I spend a lot of my time working on issues of gun violence. And I can say that the thing that has created national attention to gun violence is the fact that, you know, bluntly, um, white upper middle class kids are getting killed now. And that's why the national attention has turned to it um, in a way that was not paid in the 90s or, or the 2000s. Um, I, I hate to say it, but I think that a lot of the determinant of whether this leads to a restructuring of healthcare and, and an attention to these um, structural issues uh, is, is gonna, it's gonna be two things. So one is the degree to which we see a second peak of this pandemic um, and the degree to which that kind of reaches all across the United States. They're reporting now that um, you know, all 50 states obviously have been touched, but also that the majority of rural counties now have a case. Um, and I think that the more that this pandemic uh, touches, uh, it, the more that every American knows someone who's touched, when it's like civil rights, it's like gay marriage, the more that we all know someone who's been affected, the more likely that we are to see systemic change. Um, the second part of it, of course, is our political leadership. And I suspect that we will see some shifts in individual states, um, whether we see a shift on a national level, similar to what was seen with the New Deal or with Great Society, um, is going to depend on what happens in November, to a large extent. Something's happening in November? And also, we, uh, who knows? As, maybe it will or maybe it won't. We'll, we'll see. Important, but... No, no. So, so technically, the president cannot move the the, uh, uh, the election. Only Congress can actually move election day, and it's also implemented by states. So, it's probably almost for sure they're going to be in November, and much more vote by mail than anybody has ever seen before. But the the other thing that state le state legislative elections are as important for this particular issue as Trump or no Trump. It really, it's, people forget about the fact that states are just the epicenter here for so many things. So many governors are up, so many state legislators are up. That's what people have to remember. Try not to focus too much on the Trump or Biden question or Sanders, well, not Sanders anymore. Uh, really, state legislators will decide where this money goes and how it's spent. And I, I do wanna actually say there, um, I want to put a very clear and um, present Thank you to Governor Raimondo and to Dr. Alexander Scott here in Rhode Island, who have made issues of equity and access um, core to our state's response, who have rolled out tremendous levels of COVID-19 testing across the state, and who have paid attention to ways to use digital health to try to both um, improve access to care and to improve access to testing and to equalize um, contact tracing. They've paid attention to issues of language, of insurance status. We're very early to open up, reopen the healthcare exchange for people who um, need insurance and, and didn't have it and hadn't managed to sign up on the last go round. And so I think it's a great example, Wendy, of what you're talking about, about the importance of state level leadership. Um, and we're seeing it right here in Rhode Island in a very, very real and cogent way. Of course, Dr. Alexander Scott is a Brown alum, um, but uh, regardless of that, it's just been a uh, really impressive and thoughtful response locally. Not perfect, but that's not, I mean, that's because of, again, these like national supply issues and, and, and larger um, problems. That's a good point. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Alexander Scott, Director of Health here in Rhode Island and closely affiliated with Brown. All right, um, now I'm gonna to get to a tough question because it involves turning the microscope back on ourselves. Um, and I will open it up for uh, any of you guys to answer. Um, so 
the university was put in an unenviable spot by having to negotiate public health and education concerns as they sent undergraduates home. In retrospect, could Brown have done anything to handle the situation more effectively? Um, I will not pick on anyone, but I'll open it up to see. I mean, I guess thoughts. effectively, I, I, I mean, I think it was very, I, I think the university um, gave some signals that they would have to go in this direction. Uh, I think they handled it better than Harvard, for example, if you learn about the Ivies, which just sort of sent everybody home in three days. You know, initially the president and provost wanted to give students 10 days, which I think was a pretty long period of time, and coordinate it with spring break so that people who were trying to go home for spring break anyway would just go home. Uh, unfortunately, things spread faster than they had control over, and they had to cut those days back. So they gave them five days instead of 10, which was unfortunate and, of course, traumatic. But the, the infrastructure at Brown, I will say just as a professor and obviously the people supporting um, this webinar, uh, people at Watson, people at Brown, you know, we got up and running really quickly for virtual learning. It's not perfect, but the university, like, basically put all, you know, pedal to the metal to have everybody have access to be able to provide some education for the students. And I think that, that I think they tried as hard as they could. And I think under the circumstances were as successful as they could be. Yeah, I'll just echo that. I've seen uh, other uh, responses by other universities, um, you know, Harvard, one of them, uh, my wife's also a college professor where they were expecting their students to continue taking classes as they had like three or four days to uh, pack up and go home, which was just, you know, I'm sure they looked at that in retrospect as ridiculous. So I, I agree. I think Brown did a, a, a very great, good job at this. There's, there is some concern. I will, I will just start to echo these concerns, like so the shops and restaurants and businesses on Thayer Street. That's the governor. That's, you know, the mayor of Warza and Governor Raimondo. But, you know, there's a huge, huge hit to the local economy with dispersion of RISD, Providence College, you know, Rhode Island College, Johnson and Wales, and Brown all leaving. It's just a huge hit. And I think Brown's been sort of just scrambling to take care of Brown, which is what it needs to do. But uh, as a predominant institution, pr prominent institution in Rhode Island, you know, there will be pressure, I think, in the coming months to figure out what we can do for the community more directly. And I think that's a viable, legitimate question by people who are living in Providence. And, and we're going to have to come up with an answer individually, but also as, you know, as a, a player, a team player in the community. It's an excellent point. And, you know, I think while, you know, the crisis certainly caught many by surprise, and there was, I think, a very brief period at the beginning of March where a, flip, a switch flipped here in the United States, recognizing that, oh, wow, this is actually something that we need to care about and care about deeply, um, as opposed to something that we can watch from the sidelines like every other major crisis uh, over the past couple decades. Um, and I think that was a difficult transition for all institutions in the country, including Brown, including many other universities. Um, we are, right now we have uh, the luxury of time though. We have time to plan for how we move forward. And so uh, I'm very you know, honored to be on uh, President Paxson's new Healthy Fall 2020 Task Force, uh, which actually has our first meeting uh, later today. And we're beginning the planning process even before uh, we've gotten over the hump of the curve here in Rhode Island to think about how we reopen up the campus in the fall and how we can safely work to ensuring that we can have a productive university life and uh, teaching environment uh, come the fall. So, uh, Moving along with uh, some of the other questions. Um, so I will uh, direct this next one uh, actually to, well, we've touched on this a little bit. I'll kind of open it up to several of you, Dr. Rainey and uh, Dr. Lurie, um, especially, uh, but also uh, Professor Schiller. Can any of the panelists speak about how structural problems in the US healthcare system inhibit our ability to respond? And in particular, uh, would Medicare for all, as Bernie Sanders has advocated, have improved our response to this crisis or not? Wow, that is a, um, that, that's, a that's a lovely question. I think it is a, also a very, very difficult one um, to answer uh, in a lot of ways. So it's easier to answer which parts of the health system are currently broken than, to, sorry, apologies for the background noise. That would be my eight-year-old. Um, <laughs> we can talk about distance learning and all of the successes therein. Um, 
Uh, but uh, so I think that it's easier to talk about um, where we could, where there are problems with the current system than to prognosticate whether Medicare for all would make a difference because Medicare for all is ultimately about the financing and is not necessarily about the systemic organization, right? And so I think when we talk about where the problems are, it's more about the organization. Uh, the profit motive certainly is part of it, but Medicare for all does not get rid of the profit motive um, entirely. So let me talk about the problems. So uh, there, there's a bunch of issues. Um, one is the supply chain. So um, the way that healthcare is currently structured, um, it has largely been corporatized. Um, so, you know, people say very appropriately so in some respects over the last uh, two decades. Um, most hospitals work on a lean system where they keep, you know, just enough supply in hand. They calculate out their burn rate of equipment um, and of protect and of um, masks and gowns and are not set up to have huge reserves, um, which cost a lot of money to maintain. Um, our own system that Adam and I work at, Lifespan, um, had a, a, a central supply of protective gear because of the fact that we were really the Ebola prep preparation center, SARS, et cetera, that we were able to call on, but most healthcare systems across the United States have neither the financial reserves um, uh, nor the um, desire, honestly, to um, maintain those those large kind of um, uh, uh, reserves during normal times. Um, so that corporatization has an impact. There's also the fact that there are very few private practice stocks at this point um, nationally. Um, uh, increasing number of um, physicians are part of larger conglomerates, um, either affiliated with an academic institution or with a large hospital system or increasingly with corporate medical groups, many of which are owned by private equity firms. And that, um, again, that profit motive is, um, I'm not impugning it, there is you know, value in capitalism, um, but it, it changes the way that calculations are made around staffing um, and around the organization of medicine um, that lead to not just equipment, but also space being at a premium. You know, hospitals try to operate at 90% capacity um, at all times. And those of us in the emergency department see the effects of that every single day, even when we're outside of a pandemic situation where we're struggling with boarding and with adequate access to care for vulnerable populations. Um, but those, those effects are really heightened. Um, the last part is because of the way that um, uh, again, leaving aside the insurance issue, which is a whole separate thing, but um, because of the way that the healthcare system is organized, there really is not, you know, we have the Joint Commission, we have the ACGME that oversees residencies, there are some national bodies that oversee aspects um, of healthcare, but, um, you know, each hospital system is separate and is allowed to manage itself separately and there's no national direction, um, and, and you could argue over whether there should be, uh, but the reality is, is that, you um, the federal government can't really say, hey, every hospital, you must do X. Um, they can do it within like Center for Medicare and Services, within CMS, providing guidelines on what we do when we take care of patients with Medicare, but that's really not universal. Then lastly, there is the insurance issue, right? So, you know, there are lots of stories about patients being afraid about cost um, with showing up at the emergency department or the cost of COVID-19 testing. And an early focus of many of us in healthcare in the policy space was around waiving those costs for patients, about making sure that COVID-19 testing and treatment um, was free or that you know, folks wouldn't get stuck with either a large deductible or a large bill. Um, but that has implications on the other side for how providers and healthcare systems stay afloat, right? So you know, would national insurance fix it? Possibly, um, and, and I think there are a lot of advantages to having Medicare for all, but the devil is really in the details. Um, and I would say that this is much more about having an adequate public health infrastructure and adequate federal leadership on supply chains and on um, uh, kind of quick response to pandemics than it is necessarily about the insurance system per se. Although I welcome others thoughts too. Oh, that was pretty comprehensive. I, I think I think what I think what what one thing I think when we think about healthcare moving forward um, is that uh, just like after you know what what led to the adoption of ACA or Obamacare, as imperfect as it was, and I think this president has now learned that websites can crash um, depending on any sector, right? Banking, small business, or Obamacare. But the point is that, you know, an economic disaster led people to say, you know, health insurance shouldn't be tied to employment. 
And I think now with now they think the number today is 17 million newly unemployed people in the, in the country. You know, the political cry to be sure that you can be have health care and be able to pay for that. And, and in an emergency, uh, when you don't have a job that provides that for you, whether you're a gig economy or you're not, I think that's just the pressure is going to grow. And I think Megan and Dr. Rainey is completely right about whether it's Medicare for all or something else, you know, the level of acceptance by the American people of not having that, I think is going to go way down after this crisis, during it and after it. And so when you think about this in the fall, when it comes up again, you know, some sort of system that is easier to navigate and more readily available to more people, particularly people who are in their 50s and 60s prior to Medicare, who lose their jobs and aren't getting them back, I think that pressure is going to reemerge again in this election season. And I think we're going to see some changes. I just don't know how they're going to take shape and whether they're going to start at the state level first, if there's any money there, and go straight up to the federal level. And, and then, Wendy, if I can just kind of go off of that, there's also the flip side, which is the effect on providers. Um, and CMS and Medicare and Medicaid are absolutely amazing, and I am a huge supporter of all of them. I will also say, as a frontline healthcare provider, that the billing and coding regulations are onerous um, and sometimes impede my ability to provide good care. We get sometimes these dictums from above that don't have a lot of basis in science or in ethics or in equity that we are required to follow that sometimes truly, um, you know, overall, I think that they're beneficial, but there are, there's a, there's a kind of give and take. And one of the things that we're seeing during COVID-19 is a relaxation of many of those regulations. You know, mm -hmm. HIPAA has been waived for telehealth right now, which is terrific because it was a huge barrier to us rolling out telehealth. Um, there's discussions about the ways that our charting and coding are happening that may change. And so my hope would be that you know, we can marry the best of both systems so that we can have insurance, which from an individual consumer or uh, from a population level is so needed to have insurance for all. But then we can also um, uh, mitigate some of the bureaucracy, which really hurts uh, providers' ability um, to take care of patients and which pr um, results in a lot of unnecessary administrative overhead. You know, to be clear, creating Medicare for all is not going to get rid of administrative overhead. Mm -hmm. It will get rid of parts of it, um, but there's a lot of regulations around Medicare and Medicaid, which we will, uh, which may actually kind of increase um, if we create Medicare for all. Okay. And so just as, uh, as we finish up, I will have one Final question directed to everyone on the panel. Um, there's actually five or six questions that are all various flavors of the same question, which is please peer into your crystal ball and tell us what the future looks like. So specifically after we get over this initial peak, uh, which hopefully we will, um, what does the next year look like before we have a vaccine? What is life gonna be like in the United States? What is our healthcare system gonna look like? What is mental health gonna look like? and what are our politics gonna look like in this country? We will start with Dr. Lurie, because he has the best crystal ball, and then we'll move on to everyone else. I'm afraid my crystal ball is pretty cloudy because there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, I do think that it's fair to say that things are gonna be, that our lives are gonna be drastically changed for the foreseeable future. Um, I think that there's a way to start to open up that's not an on-off switch. I think an on-off switch is, is very dangerous and it would require us waiting until we've essentially eliminated uh, all new infections, uh, which is a very long time to wait. Um, but there are mid ways of opening, uh, safer ways of opening that are uh, structured and uh, stepwise. Uh, so for instance, we may start opening some restaurants uh, but require that um, they can only fill half of their seats at any given time. Or we might start uh, reopening some sporting events, but require that the stadium can only be, say, 10 or 15 percent full, something like that. So I think a lot of those kinds of mitigation efforts are going to come in. Um, the shorter answer to your question, though, is it all depends on what we do. If we open too early, uh, and um, then all of our mitigation efforts to date could essentially be for naught. Um, if we open while there's still significant infections raging in our communities, then we basically achieve nothing over the last four or five weeks when we shut down completely. So finding that sweet spot about when to open and when to do it slowly uh, is gonna be critically important, but it's very clear that if you do things much quicker 
quicker than should be done, that we're gonna be back to the drawing board again, back at point, back at the, uh, back where we were at the beginning of this epidemic with lots of new infections coming down the road. Let's hope that we don't do that. Let's hope that we're um, smart enough to uh, balance the uh, competing uh, economic and health impacts. Um, but I sure hope that we are able to um, uh, make the decision based on data, uh, make the decision based on where the epidemic actually is and where it's going, and not based solely on economic imperatives, which would have us open much quicker than many of us public health people would be very comfortable with. Okay, and quickly, one minute for each of the rest of you. Uh, uh, Dr. Rainey, would you like to go next? Uh, sure, so I will be uh, quick. So from the health perspective, I've already talked about, I think we could go utopian to creating this beautiful new world of digital health and health equity, or we could go dystopian with um, uh, closures of critical access hospitals, community health centers, um, and increased inequity in the system. Um, I also think that as a society, uh, this is going to fundamentally reshape the way that we all relate and interact. And I'm sure that Judd will talk more about this. Um, but as a parent of two school-age kids, I am watching the degree to which they are interacting purely online at this point. And um, I think it's going to be really uh, important for us in healthcare to keep an eye on that and on its effects, again, on our most vulnerable populations. My crystal ball is also imperfect. Uh, but I promise that I will work hard, as will many of my colleagues here at Brown, to try to create the more utopian vision of what our healthcare system and health equity will look like going forwards. Dr. Brewer? I'll say, I would suggest that we can actually create our own crystal balls. So if we think of um, our comfort zones, we've all been moved, forced out of our comfort zone. Now, beyond the comfort zone could be a growth zone or where we can either run because of fear into a panic zone beyond that or run back to our comfort zones where we you know, hold fast in our old habits. So here I would suggest that if we can actually really notice the benefits and the, and the joys and the qualities of working together, we can actually learn to have this growth zone be our new normal where we can learn to be with uncertainty in a way that doesn't frighten us but really helps us open to see that and everything with new possibility. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just finish with this, that <clears throat> I'm hoping that uh, politicians, whatever party they're from, perspective they have, recognize the lesson of the 2007, 8, and 9 uh, re deep recession, great recession. You know, many, many people were left behind. And even though they, quote unquote, recovered, many people did not fully recover their, either their asset, their wealth, their equity, whatever it was, just their job itself. And this has enormous implications. And this is gonna be exponentially larger, a problem for the next five to 10 years again. And I just hope we do not make the same mistake by leaving anybody behind. And if the new world is digital and the new world is virtual, then trying very hard to bring as many of those people who are now left behind into that world in an economically productive way. And that's, um, that's just gotta be imperative. Otherwise we will just cycle through the cycle of politics that we've had uh, for the last decade, and I don't think that'll be productive. Thank you. So uh, with that, I think we'll close the webinar. I want to thank again all four of our panelists for joining us today. I want to thank the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, the Warren Alpert School of Medicine, and the School of Public Health for sponsoring this event. Uh, and I also really want to thank uh, John Maza and Ellen White for providing technical assistance to us today. I apologize to all the folks on YouTube who we didn't get to answer your questions. We just ran out of time, uh, but hopefully this will be a continuing conversation and we'll have uh, future opportunities to discuss more as time goes on. So thank you everyone. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy.